like to talk a little bit about the heart chakra. The heart chakra is the fourth chakra, counting from the bottom, and it's in the middle of the chest. So the heart chakra is kind of a difficult chakra. It's also very different from the first three chakras. The first three chakras have to do a lot with you as a person. What do you want? Who are you? What is your power? What is your method? So it's very much about self-expression. The heart chakra is much more about listening, about opening up to the world, allowing yourself to be uh, connected with the world. So both allowing other people to come into your life, but also allowing yourself to flow into other people's space. Now the heart chakra by its very nature is very, a very boundless chakra, but there are differences in the shape of this chakra. One of the most telling differences is how wide or how narrow this chakra is. And this tells a lot about how people work with their attachment, with their love energy. People who have a very narrow chakra, they are by nature very uh, monomanic, uh, monogamous in, uh, in nature. They are very selective. They don't open their hearts to just anybody. They usually choose one partner and invest very heavily in being together with that partner. Uh, the opposite is people who have a very broad and very wide heart chakra. So these are people who are more um, loving towards everybody and everything. So a very wide heart chakra um, usually shows people who have very little distinction in sex or age or looks or even species uh, when it comes to their love or appreciation for others. They will connect quite as easily with a dog or a horse or a pig or a man or a woman. And usually most people are a little bit somewhere between these two extremes of only one is the true love and loving everybody and everything. What is also important to note is that depending on a person's um, you know, racial background, there's also a difference in how these heart chakras are. So we, you could say that we have a genetic disposition towards a certain type of society, a certain type of behavior. And here is where it gets a little bit interesting. Um, because if we look towards Western Europe, um, then most people in uh, prehistoric times have been living in a rather clannish form. So they had uh, an extended family and this was what they felt love and loyalty to. Um, so usually they're, yeah, they're family in a larger sense. Um, and once it started to become uh, Romanized and through Romanization become Christianized, a very different ideal started to uh, be put forward. It was not so much about the clan or the group, but uh, people had to be very devoted to just one other person, their partner, with whom they were connected through marriage. So going from a rather harem-like uh, structure, which was natural for most people, um, the culture changed and expected them to be very monogamous. Well, as we know, since there is roughly 70% uh, rate of people cheating on their partners. Um, ultimately, the culture is not winning over uh, our energetical makeup. But many people feel very bad about it because they are expecting themselves to be as expected by society. They are expecting themselves like, okay, gosh, I got married to this person. So I should not think of other men or other women. I should not be interested in them. I should have eyes only for my partner. This is what my partner wants and expects of me. This is what I want and expect of her. So why can't I do that? Well, the answer is because you were not made to be like that, made to do that. And 
here it's also very important to distinguish a little bit between our energetic structure and our behavior because it's very well possible for a person um, to have a very wide heart chakra and therefore connect to everything and everybody but that does not mean that they have to act in such a way that they um, end up in relationships with all of them they can still be uh, very monogamous in their behavior while in their hearts they are connecting to other people but it's a little bit unnatural it creates a little bit of tension and here is where you need to make a choice whether to live according to what is natural for you with all the insecurities and instabilities which that brings along with it um, or to try to recreate the older form of indeed living in a community a family unit and having your loyalties to an extended uh, group of people rather than becoming very individualized as is the current fashion in Western Europe so here we have a little bit of a conflict between nature and nurture to understand a little bit more about the why of these differences uh, we can look at the animal kingdom in the animal kingdom we find all three patterns we find animals which are very monogamous which basically mate for life we find animals which have a harem they're usually uh, uh, the males are very territorial they control an area they drive out all other males and they get the right to mate with all females within their territory and you have beings which are promiscuous which will just have intercourse with whatever male being comes along and the sperm of the different males will fight it out within the female to see which one will get to produce the offspring so humans are in a way using all three of these methods and each method has its advantages and disadvantages otherwise these different evolutionary strategies would not exist so what you find is that if uh, a child requires a lot of investment uh, it cannot take care of itself very quickly um, then it is very necessary for the parents to be caring parents not to just have a child and run off but to try to protect and support the child so that that child will have a bigger chance of survival and through surviving it will be able to create offspring so a monogamous uh, type of animal will invest heavily in the offspring and will also invest heavily in yeah, the well-being of the partner um, and this is a, a good strategy if there is indeed a very limited amount of offspring um, so often if you have animals which have like uh, 10 uh, little ones per litter um, you won't find this kind of behavior but if you have just one or two then this behavior is actually relatively common so on the other opposite indeed we have uh, the animals like for instance mice who have lots and lots of offspring uh, for insects the same goes they have usually thousands of eggs which they lay and here it is not so much about parenting because the offspring will just compete against each other and the healthiest of that offspring will survive and to procreate so here the selection is not actually through the parents in how good are the parents are taking care of the little one but the selection is more intrinsically within the, the child can a child take care of itself if yes okay then it will create more offspring if no then it will be unsuccessful so also in parenting style it is completely different so the children are almost abandoned at, uh, at birth or given a very short start in life so there's a little investment of food care and warmth but very quickly usually within weeks the children are yeah supposed to fend for themselves you also find animals which have a more harem like structure and this actually has a dual purpose on the one hand the parenting is shared so there is not just the biological parents who have to raise the child 
but it's actually all the members of the extended group which are taking care of the children. Um, so even that if a child is not biologically yours, it is uh, taken care of because by supporting the child, you're supporting the group which you are part of and which your children are or will be a part of. So it is not so much about you as an individual and your child being successful. It is more about your group being successful and the children of your group being successful. So it is much more of a collective conscience. And this is actually what was natural in uh, Western Europe before the Romanization and Christianization. So in this system it is much more about um, there being a parent, there being a guardian, than who is it. So you don't have to be a perfect guardian, you just have to know people who are perfect guardians for the children. And also you could say the uh, the habit of grandparents taking care of the children because the parents are still fit and strong and they have to fight for survival and bring in money and uh, support the family that way. It's also very much in concert with that type of energetic structure. And I feel that for the Western European people this is actually the most um, natural uh, state of being. What also happens is that the experience is very different. So people who have a very broad heart chakra, um, they tend to connect with everything, but because there is so much to connect to, usually the connections are very much focused on what is useful, either to them or the other. So the relationships themselves tend to be a lot about what is useful, what do I need, um, so often the fulfilling of desires is very important in those types of relationships or if you're that type of person. If you're, on the contrary, a very narrow person who's very monogamous, then you're actually looking towards one person, your partner, to fulfill all your desires and all your needs. And you'll often be very frustrated because it is almost impossible for one person to fulfill each and every need which you might have and this often leads to a lot of frustrations within such a very narrow relationship. If the partner is not behaving as the other partner would like it often can result in power struggles. Um, on the opposite if a person has a very wide heart chakra then the person will simply shift instead of like being with that person oh if you cannot provide what I need I'll shift to that person who can provide what I need. The average structure, the harem-like structure, uh, they in a way strike a middle ground. So uh, people make deeper and longer lasting relationships than uh, people with a very wide um, heart structure, but they're also not as focused as a person who's purely uh, focused on one partner. So longer lasting relationships with a good amount of depth but not quite as much as if you would be completely monogamous. And if you can realize what is the shape of your heart structure and also what is the shape of the heart structure of other people then there will be a lot less frustration and confusion um, because people always tend to think that everybody is exactly the same as them. If I'm a very monogamous person, I'm expecting my partner to behave in the same way, to have only eyes for me, to think only of me, to think only of me. But if that person is very different, uh, then I will quickly be confused or uh, disappointed by their behavior. And the same goes for a person who has a very wide structure who's thinking like ah oh, but our exchange is positive so what are you bothering about so what if i'm also looking at other people or having an interest in other people that doesn't mean i don't like you as well or love you as well and why should it be exclusive i don't get it so 
it's generally quite difficult to find a create a harmonious relationship if you have very different heart structures and this goes both for romantic relationships as well as for uh, friendships and even business relationships because also in business a person with a very wide structure will be very um, practical just thinking like okay I feel no particular loyalty to any supplier or any specific uh, customer I'll just take whichever is yeah, is best and whichever generates uh, a good amount of uh, of return of in, uh, of investment. While a person who's very monogamous in their heart structure will often get, feel a very strong attachment to a specific brand, to a specific supplier, to a specific client, and they will often go out of their way and even harm their business to maintain that relationship with that client or with that supplier. So knowing to understand the heart chakra is really understanding how other people feel, how other people react, what is their intuition, what is their emotional language uh, telling them, what is it informing them about. The heart chakra itself also by being boundless, needs to be compensated a little bit by the lower chakra. Because the heart chakra itself does not give you direction. It just connects to whatever happens to be in front of you at that moment. It is really the, not so much the heart which chooses, it is much more the lower chakras which choose. The lower chakras have a certain desire. They have a sense of self. Who am I? What do I want? What is my method? And according to what the lower chakras are okay with and are opening up to, the heart chakra is also able to connect. So usually the third chakra creates kind of a filter, but only the things which pass through that filter are available for the heart chakra to connect to. If by any chance that filter somehow happens to fail, then the heart chakra often gets very overwhelmed because it will try to connect to everything and everybody. And this will often lead to very detrimental relationships and very detrimental yeah, uh, friendships or even uh, business contacts. Because all the contacts and all the communication which will go on will not support the person's own desires, the person's own development. So this is really something to watch out for, the interaction between these two chakras. So in the next video I will go a little bit into typical problems which happen with this chapter.